Good morning. Uh, I, I'd like to welcome everybody on behalf of the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy. Uh, the minister apologizes for being late. He was trying to demonstrate that the United States has had inadequate infrastructure investment. <laughs> and so, uh, like many things, uh, we'll somehow find someone else to blame, right? Uh, the minister is going to speak for about 10 minutes, and then I'm going to ask him some questions. I'll keep the introduction short. Uh, uh, Paulo Guedes has been, is been since January what they call a super minister in Brazil. One ministry wasn't enough for him, so he has finance, planning, and industry. He has a Chicago, University of Chicago PhD in economics, spent several decades in banking, and is, is new to government. Uh, it comes to this job at a pivotal moment in Brazil's economy and is pushing a very important and uh, sweeping pension reform. So with that, minister. Good morning, everybody. A few words first about what is going on down there. I think we have the dynamics of an open society, a very vibrant democracy. After 30 years, well, first we had 20 years of uh, military government, closed, politically closed system, investing a lot on infrastructure through the state companies, Electrobras, Telebras, Petrobras, Cidebras, and so on. When we re-democratize, we try to transform a Hobbesian state machine into a Russonian will of the people machine. But the economists were not, and the politicians, not wise enough to make the transformation, privatizing the old companies, decentralizing resources to invest on human capital, education, health, and so on. So the general direction was good to satisfy the requirements of an emerging democracy, but we mismanaged the transformation. It took so long, we got lost in the hyperinflation, two hyperinflations, two bursts of hyperinflation, extent of that moratorium, and finally two big recessions. But all the time, institutions getting better, perfecting democratic institutions. So we had impeachment, the legislative power declared its independence, making an impeachment at the right first, and then at the left. When the executive power tried to buy political support in the Congress, they awakened the judiciary power that put both on jail, who bought and who sold. Nobody's above the law, rule of law, voting machine every two years. And for the first time, quite natural, we had the right first in a politically closed system. Then we had social democrats, political alliances, center left, winning all elections. And now we discovered we have conservatives and liberals in a political alliance center right. So what was a very vibrant democracy working was interpreted abroad by the establishment that was disrupted as a threat to democracy. There was no threat whatsoever. There is no threat whatsoever. There will be no threat whatsoever to democracy. It's a very vibrant democracy. And when even the conventional media fell in love with the establishment, it was disrupted. A man was elected spending less than a million dollars. What does it say about democracy? What does it say about new social media disrupting conventional media? Should conventional media depart from what people are feeling? And what people were feeling was a new agenda about customs, about principles and values. A man could have bad manners and great principles and values. And a lot of people have good manners and very bad principles and values. So it was a political, so my first line is about politics is, don't feel sorry for us. We have a very vibrant democracy, and it is now a political alliance, center left, center right. After 30 years of left, no problem. Four years like that, maybe eight, who knows? No danger at all, institutions getting perfect. And we will show that very soon to everybody. Now to the economics. Um, 
that was a transition. Politically, but economically, what happened in Brazil, and then for the last four to five decades. So it's not a problem with democracy itself. Even the military, at the end of their regime, they were already feeling the bites of a dirigist economy. So public expenditures came from 18% of GDP at the beginning of the military government to 26, 27, when the military left. Then it kept going higher to 32, 34, 36, 40, 42, 45 percent of GDP. This is the Brazilian history of uncontrollable public spending for almost 50 years. So Brazil that was a very fast growing economy, one of the fastest growing economy in the world for at least three quarters of the last century. Brazil had an average yearly growth rate beyond 7%. Brazil used to grow faster than China, faster than Japan, faster than Korea for a very, very long period of time in the past century. And then because of excess of public expenditures, first with the military and then at the end with the uh, democratic governments that increased social expenditures legitimately natural requirements of an emerging democracy, but they did, don't, they did not dismantle the privileges and the subsidies and the uh, misallocation of funds uh, that they received. So it was an incomplete transition. Economically, we are in a phenomenon which is an incomplete transition. But the dynamics are, is of a, a great open society, a Popperian great open society. Uh, independent powers, free press. If the conventional press misbehaves, they, they lose because the social media disrupt them. Uh, and the economy trying to get in the right direction, but without controlling public spending. So our program was a very simple one. Um, first one, conceptually. Of course, I would love to do what Ludwig Erhard did in Germany uh, for 10 years. I would love to do what Thatcher, what Reagan did. I would love to do what the Chicago boys did in Chile. So it would be wonderful to do with the Chicago oldies. So I got a lot of Chicago oldies, um, guys from the old Chicago school, just to go in that direction. It can't, it's not reasonable, the eighth largest economy in the world to be the 126 in ease of doing business, 129 in openness, degree of openness. It just doesn't make sense. So we need some Chicago boys. Don't, don't turn away from market people, market-driven people. We must change the economic axis from state companies intervention to market-driven, from a very closed economy to an open economy. Well, well, but there is a global world war, not at us not with us. We are so close. We don't even feel the noise of the global trade war. We trade with China. We trade with the U.S. Very little with both. So um, our program was conceptually, we call it the road to prosperity. Just as a, putting together the road to serfdom, which is negative, of Hayek, and prosperity through competition of Ludwig Erhard. So put both together, just put a sign and say, we are opening the economy, we are going to be a market-driven economy. Uh, we will reduce the statization of credit, 40%, 50% of Brazilian credit. It misallocated because it's through um, either two or three uh, great public banks or uh, through subsidies. Uh, generalized subsidies, tax exemptions, and things like that. So very high taxes. Um, so our program was, number one concern, what is the fastest growing public expenditures so that we got to 45%? Because, see, we had a hyperinflation. It's a symptom, a manifestation of uncontrolled public spending. At the end of the military government, we had a sequence of exchange rate crises. Uh, recycling petrodollars to accelerate public spending. 
so we have the petrodollars to recycle. So there should be no exchange rate crisis. You are receiving money from abroad, the petrodollar recycling at the end of the 70s. But we spent so much that even though the phenomenon was caused by recycling of petrodollars, at the end we were with recurrent exchange rate crisis. So we spent everything we received and more. Then we went to domestic financing to subsidize agriculture in the very last public government under the military rule. And then inflation moved from 36, 37, 40% a year to 200% a year. And then the military got out by the back door. And the private guys moved in and they control prices, like in Venezuela. And then seize financial resources, uh, blockade financial savings, crazy, stupid, silly policies. And then we go to higher inflation twice. Who is behind the scene? Public spending, uncontrollable. Now, inflation gets down, institutions being perfected, an independent central bank in a lame duck government, a government because there was impeachment, the vice president took power, and the man is three and a half percent popular support. So lame duck, no control whatsoever, receives inflation at 11%. In two years, inflation is 3.7%. What happened? An independent central bank, even though it's not in the law. But institutions get imperfect all the time. Judiciary power, independent central bank, legislative power that impeaches president at the right and at the left. So we have the dynamics of an open society. Don't feel concerned. Don't feel sorry or sad about where we are going. We are moving well. The losers in the election gave a very wrong impression because they were disrupted. So they're saying bad things, they're impressed with bad manners and things like that. But we know what we are doing. We are very constructive, and the Congress will be very constructive, and we are moving forward. So the plan is, number one, explosion of public expenditures, must control that. First item, personal. Inside that, inactives, so social security reform. Is the pension reform. It's, it's, it's a fiscal hole. It's a black hole. It's swallowing the whole economy. Uh, so it's 770 billion. Uh, it's the largest, by far, public spending. So we attack that with the proposal of social security reform. We can talk about that later. Number two, expenditures, higher expenditures. Not only the government spends a lot, but spends unwisely. We build one Europe every year. A Marshall Plan is $100 billion. We build one Europe without getting out of Brazil. So whoever builds on Europe should become Europe. But if you spend one Europe next year, one Europe next year, one Euro, $100 billion a year just to serve public debt. What is public debt? Unwise past, an unwise past of public spending, fighting inflation only with the central bank. So a snowball indebtedness, an internal debt. Instead of having the manifestation of unwise and uncontrollable public spending under the form of a hyperinflation, we now have it in a snowball in that business. And then this lack of coordination of monetary and fiscal policy leaves their digitals there, which is $100 billion rebuilding one Europe without leaving Brazil. So you are still Brazil, we build on Europe, still Brazil, we rebuild on Europe. It's very poor judgment of past governments on how to fight inflation without fiscal coordination. So social security reform, number one. Number two, highest expenditures, it's interest, which is usually year by year, on a year by year basis, you look at that thing and say, it's uncontrollable. We have an independent central bank. Interest rates is whatever it is, but we have the stock of the debt in the past. It's given. It's uncontrollable. F fake news. It's not uncontrollable. We'll change the whole trajectory. If we privatize, accelerate it, and we reduce that, we have more than a trillion in value of state companies. We have more than a trillion 
with 700,000 real estate units owned by the union. Even the embassy here, wonderful, was bought in the 30s. It's worth a lot of money. When the ambassador jokingly said, well, I'm retiring, but I'm not costing anything to you guys because I am already retired. I said, well, if we, sell, we can sell your house. <laughs> I'm sleeping there. Wonderful place. <laughs> it's normal temptation to keep these things. If you go to Rome, it's in Piazza Navona. If you go to Milan, it's by the side of the Domo. Uh, it's wonderful things. We bought by coffee, giving coffee in the 30s after the war. Wonderful things. I look at those things and I think <laughs> we can really reduce our debt. Um, so number two is accelerate privatization. Number three, expenditure. The machine itself, the wage bill. Wage is going 7% real a year. So inflation is 10%. Give public employees, 10% plus 7. So you created a cast of privileges, people who make three, four times their wages comparable in the private sector, exactly like it happens in their social security benefits and pensions. The average is three, four, five times than an ordinary citizen. So number three is, and the good news, human capital depreciates and eventually dies. 40% will retire. 40 to 50% will retire in the next four to five years. Great news. We'll not replace that. We'll, we'll digitalize, we'll simplify, and we'll cut without hurting anyone. They just retired, and we don't let new admissions and public, um, they call it exams, concursos, uh, admission, admission tests. So just close the admission tests, one, two, three, four years. Of course, there will be exceptions here and there, but as a general rule, fix this thing, and then it will um, deflate naturally. So, first one, social security. Second one, accelerate privatization to hit the expenditures in interest, to change the balance sheet like a company. Just change the balance sheet. Sell some assets, reduce some debt, and change the future trajectory. So, it's all about trajectories. Feeling, change the path of social security. Change the path of interest rate payments for the future. Change the path of the public sector wage bill. Then, Reduce tax and simplify taxes. So corporate tax is 35% in Brazil, 34. Uh, dividends don't pay tax because they've been already charged. So what about if the U.S. changes corporate tax to 20? We should change to 15. Why should someone open in Brazil if could open in the U.S. paying less tax? So we should reduce even more. But then you tax dividends in the other side. Uh, Brazil has more than 40 different kinds of taxes in a highly centralized fashion. So what we'll do is exactly to simplify, to collapse four, five, six tax in one single federal tax, value-added basis, simple thing, uh, with digital controls you have now, uh, things that used to be complex, paper filling and then things like that. It's just digital. You, you credit yourself, you debit yourself when... The, when you buy something, there's a lot of credits of taxes that came. When you sell it, there's a lot of, uh, there is then a, a credit to you. You just, um, can, one can seal the other, whatever is the value left. You compare with the uh, value added base tax, and that's it. So we'll be simplifying and reducing tax. Uh, like I said, it doesn't make sense to be the eighth largest economy in the world and, and being 120 something ease of doing business. Um, uh, so our target is to come from 120 to less than 50 at the end of our government. In four years, we had to be one of the 50 best places to have business in the world. Uh, we have some other, it's not just the index of ease of doing business, there's three or, or four orders like competitiveness, innovation, education, so things that we know are quite decisive to be a place 
uh, to receive investments. Um, opening the economy, we will not open linearly because we have to simplify taxes uh, and we have to improve investments in infrastructure to reduce the logistic costs in Brazil. I could give you many examples, there's no time. Okay, so finish. So if you manage to sell the Brazilian embassy in Washington because of a speech you made here, I just want to make clear, we want to cut. We want to find your speech. <laughs> uh, Minister, you set forward a very uh, powerful uh, and ambitious agenda, but I think it goes nowhere if you can't get the pension reform through. Uh, Brazil has a very generous pension system, no minimum retirement age. People retire, men at 55, 52 for women on average. Public sector, as you said, has a more generous, works out more generously from them. Uh, you say you're optimistic about getting this through. It's an ambitious political goal. You need two-thirds of the Congress because you're amending the Constitution. What happens if you don't get it through, and why should I believe you're going to make it? Well, it's a great question. Uh, well, you know, I thought I would have a lot of opposition in the Congress. But when a finance minister is applauded in the street through the social media, people began talking about social security reform, about how we are in a new political environment, about how there's no corruption in politics because we will not allow. It, it became a popular thing in Brazil. So last week there were demonstrations, public demonstrations all over the country. And to my surprise, a lot of people were screaming my name and saying, we support, oh, we support. The hold up sign support. saying, cut hold my pension? Sign. No, that's an amazing thing. <laughs> to have a finance minister getting popular is a very odd thing. <laughs> and getting popular because it's supporting a social security reform is, is a thing of another planet or a sign of maturity, of public opinion. They understand that we could become Greece, we could become Portugal. Not only social security would collapse, but also public wages, wages in the public sector, because they are going broken. So the amazing thing is that the Congress, the mayors and governors with whom I talk, they are also broken. And Social Security is there, the main problem. So they need the reform. It's not just that they want. Nobody wants a reform. But everybody understands that they need the reform. So you've had, you've had some stormy hearings before the Congress. Your plan is to save a trillion rice well, over a decade. 98% of the meetings I had in Brasilia were very successful. So when do you think it will get through? Talking to people. It will get through before the end of the first semester. This is my personal So you mean by, by July 1st? Probably. It, it will be about that time. And because politicians understand that there's, there are elections next year, next year again. We have elections every two years. So what is the wise and intelligent politician that would like to have one year before the election to be talking about this thing? Hmm. There's not one, not even in the opposition. And how so all of them understand that this is a critical thing has to be decided fast enough because you know what is the agenda for the next uh, 12 months after the approval? The decentralization of financial resources, what we call the federal pact. You had very interesting discussions here. Thomas Jefferson in the Washington government, George Washington government, Thomas Jefferson on one side, James Hamilton on the other. Very true that Hamilton died in a duel some years later and the fight continued, the Federalist Papers and all that dispute. The U.S. was built bottom-up. Thirteen colonies, some of them already with their constitution. Then the British put a tax on Tobacco. We must fight those guys. Let's create the federal government. So 60 to 70 percent of the money was with the basis, with the population, where people live. Uh, and then we create additional layers, like a pyramid. So you, you feel uh, the president of the government, 
where the population is. And then when you need an internet or the South Pacific fleet to police the area where the Chinese are expanding their influence, then it, or the internet, then you have the, or to put a man in the moon, then you have the federal government. So you uh, have that. You have but in Brazil, it's the other way around. In Brazil, 60% to 70% of the money is upstairs. So when a president likes a soccer team, a stadium pops up. When the president likes an entrepreneur, he becomes the largest entrepreneur in the world in animal uh, uh, um, protein. Uh, because you just pump 500 billion to the national uh, state bank, federal state bank, and then the national development bank pumps money, 10 billion to the guy, he comes here and buys two or three of your protein factories, and he's the largest in the world. So this is pretty wrong, they understand that. So let me we, ask must, you, let me we ask must limit and decentralize power okay, and I'm, financial I don't, I don't, resources. I have one more question about the pensions. So you've proposed a trillion, you would save a trillion reyes over trillion. a decade. Trillion. I read in the, in, the, in the press, I admit mainstream press, um, that uh, the consensus is you'll get somewhere between 600 and 700. A billion instead. Is that okay? Will, the, will that, will that be okay beauty, with you? That is the beauty of democracy. Uh, the established media says it's, just, it's going to be just 600 to 800 million. I suppose first that they are right because they might be very wrong. Last time they said this man would not be elected. But I suppose they are right. And the thing comes 600 to 800 million. Well, it's much more than the last government proposal which means that financially we will survive. Okay. What is the effect on me? I do not launch the transition to the capitalization regime. So Brazilians are saying through their Congress, a re representative democracy, they'll be saying, we are not willing to sacrifice ourselves for our sons and future generations. We prefer to have them with us in this very same plane that is going to crash one day. That's their choice. If they do that, no problem. We you, won't, you won't resign if they do that. Well, we'll continue growing 0.6% a year. We'll continue in a very mediocre growth path. But they manifested their will. I'm just making it clear. Hey, guys, do you want your son to come with a parachute so that you jump and he dies in this plane? Or do you prefer to pay for a transition to a new regime that will free future generations from this trap, low growth trap, perverse financing. The wage bill in Brazil has 100% tax on labor. So to create one, one, one job, you destroy one. You pay two to have one. Let me ask you a question about the uh, social media. I read that PNP Bariba has uh, counted the President Bolsonaro's tweets. He doesn't tweet quite as often as Donald Trump, but he's, he likes Twitter. And they said that he's tweeted more than 500 tweets since becoming president. Eight were jokes. Five were about pension reform. If social media is so important and you need the political backing of the president, why isn't the president talking more on social media about pension reform? Well, the president voted against the reform many times. It's, it's, it's more than you said. The president voted against. And when he went to the Congress, he said, listen, I regret having voted against, and I'm giving support to this thing. Is it foolhard? He's in love with the pension regime, or? Of course not. <laughs> of course not. He's a man. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's, he has some qualities that are decisive for leadership. He's transparent. He's, He's a sincere man. He's resilient. He's not afraid of the challenges. He's willing to give support something that he does not, he would not like, but he understands it's necessary. He's doing his part. He's not a fake man. He's not a man that would get there. I'm in love with this reform. No, quite the contrary. He jokes and says, listen, for me, women could retire with 20 years old. I think they deserve it's just a joke. But it's how he feels about the world. He says, well, do you really need that power? We need that. How would or you? we will go bust. He says, okay, I support that. 
How and then the social media, the social media knows that he, it's not something very pleasant to him, but he's giving support, and they understand that. There's nothing like the truth. I don't like that. I don't understand economics. My man says it's necessary. I give support. Do you want me to come here and say, I love it? I no, I will not do that. And we are mature enough to understand that. So let me ask you a question. How would you compare Bolsonaro to Trump? You see, I don't know Trump very well. And I know Bolsonaro. I met Bolsonaro one year and uh, four months ago for the first time. Uh, I understand he's playing his role, which is to disrupt conventional politics. Um, we, our dirigist economic model corrupted democracy and stagnated the economy. So from what you've seen He's Donald an Trump, agent of change. He's an think, agent of change. Do you think that? Would you say uh, the, the same only thing comparison I can make, and it's a wide, a big, 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 big problem is the following. 3.7 billion Eurasians jumped in global market, former victims of dirigist economies. Eastern Europe, India, 1.5 billion Chinese, all these guys jumped in global markets, labor global markets, and said, we want to get better. We believe markets are the best social inclusion program ever. We are getting out of misery Misery because we believe in markets now. So when the poverty is being removed from the other side of the world, we Westerns not understanding this, the fact of price equalization theorem, Stopper Samuelson, which is the Chinese does, don't, don't need to come here. They just build things there with established technologies. Trade equalizes prices and fa wages go up there and wages don't go up here. That's why we need zero interest and skyrocketing stock markets all the time to generate financial bridges to wealth because they're not coming from the real sector anymore, except for Silicon Valley. So there is a general improvement in the world income distribution. But if you take a picture locally, interest rates go down, property of people go up. If you have real estate, up. If you have equities, up. If you are just a labor man, no. Your wages lock it. So it's a very severe problem in the Western world. We have the discomfort of people who don't have social security, they don't have labor laws, they don't have tax on labor, and these people are moving and getting harder, studying more, and working harder. And we feel discomfort. And then the population looks for whoever is taking care of them. And we know that national constituencies don't solve these problems anymore. So the British vote for Brexit, the French for Macron, the Americans for Trump, and Brazilians for Bolsonaro. We are all trying to survive. Okay, we have a policy. Simple Wait, let me interrupt you. The minister has to go in a minute, but I, we always have at least one question. So I want to give someone in the audience a chance to ask one quick question, and we'll see if the minister can give a quick answer. Uh, Monica here. Please introduce yourself. Thank you, David. Monica Dubol. Um, I'm, a, I'm the director of Latin American Studies at SAIS Johns Hopkins and a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics across the street. Um, my question to you, Minister, is about the tax reform. So you've spoken about the need to, to simplify taxes to make the, the system more efficient um, and to make the system less complex. My question about that is how is that doable in the context where a lot of the taxes involved are taxes that are collected by the states, and the states and the, the finances at the subnational level are in such dire condition. Thank, Thank you. you. It's a great question. I know Monica is a very well-known, good, great reputation in Brazil as an economist. Uh, I was a student of her father at Vargas Foundation, Fioravante. Uh, and uh, the thing is, there is a long track record of tax reforms that fail in the Congress exactly on that point because people try to put all taxes together. But there is a natural resistance of states and municipalities to converge to a general tax system uh, because they are already cash stressed. They are already 
exactly because in the military government, they concentrated financial power at the top, and the civil government failed to decentralize, even created more taxes that were not distributed. We call them contributions, not distributed to mayors and uh, states, state and municipality level. But there is the press out coming, and the press out is calculated by, not by Brazilians, by Exxon, by Shell, by Total, by great uh, oil companies. Uh, between 500 billion, 500 billion and $1 trillion in the next 20 to 30 years coming out of the ground. So we will decentralize money at the margin. You don't have to change and move around the money today. All this money that comes, we'll do it inverse to what it is the current distribution. We'll put 70% to state and municipalities and only 30% to federal law. We want to shrink the federal government and expand the federal, the state and municipalities. Money has to go where people live. Because you don't feel the police there. If a guy shoots to the top here in the US, in five minutes you have eight snipers and one guy saying, drop your gun, your gun now, slowly. In Brazil, if you shoot three times, the police runs because they don't have guns. Uh, so we must decentralize this money. So the answer to Monica is, we will make a tax reform, not the one like uh, Bernardo Api that tries to grab everything and put everything together. We'll just make it at the federal level. We will take next three or four months, we will announce already contributions sobre lucros, sobre lucro liquido, peace, things social. We'll take three or four of them and we'll create the single federal tax. And then over time, we'll put more federal tax there. So we will give the example to state and municipality, but we will let them tax, let them tax. Uh, and then we will approve this thing, this simplification of federal tax reforms, because they have the perspective of having more money in the future. And this will also be used to get their approval of the reform. All of them are financially stressed. They will not approve because they love me. They approve because they need money. Minister, I'm going to interrupt you because your staff is having heart attacks here one at a time because you're late. So please, uh, thank you very much for coming, and I hope you come back later when you've finished you. all these reforms. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.